Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and just for your awareness, the time is now. It's time to qualify for Worlds. These teams are either doing it or going home. And, of course, to start the day, I'm joined on the desk with none other than our boys, Kresnik and Pretty Hair. How are you guys doing today? Doing pretty good. Yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Slightly better than Kresnik. So Ooh. I don't disagree. Slightly. I don't know. If you saw what he was wearing, he was getting a lot of compliments about that jacket. I was. They like the cat. Bringing the hood up that you could see. We'll slightly. show you maybe another time. But uh, <laughs> all good stuff here to start the day. It is a big, big day in Paladins Esports. And, of course, all these teams have been battling out the entire fall split to be here to have a chance to go to Worlds. Uh, it just takes on the day. We're starting out with Splice and Kanga, obviously. What are you looking forward to in those matches, man? Looking for in terms of the players and stuff. I mean, I'm looking for people to. They're they're gonna. I want to see players performing under pressure. This is like the highest pressure almost, right? This is the step right before. This is where they're the trying to go. To right. HRX. HRX. I mean, in in next Friday it starts. I mean, it's so soon, Nick. The 16th to the 18th. Is it kind of surreal? It's already upon us. It's crazy, and uh, it, you gotta kind of remember because I was like looking at the schedule for today, and I was like, wait, where's our grand final? I was like, wait, this isn't the end of this event. This yeah. is just the lead up to That's next right. weekend. That's right. There's so much that these teams still have to do. To to prove a lot of questions we're still asking. Let's take a look at the bracket because this has shown quite a interesting level of differences between the regions and how each of them approach the way Paladins is played from drafting differences obviously to mechanics to just play styles within games and map preferences. We've seen Fnatic and Space Station rise above the rest sending Armada and Virtus Pro down into the losers bracket for the first time yesterday. Now Virtus Pro will have a chance to go up against SK after our first set of the day, Splice and Kanga, who the winner of that will then face off against Armada to find out who will be going into Worlds in that side of the bracket. It's going to be a very, very interesting game. Fnatic Space Station, they will play later on to determine their seeding, one or two, and the winner of match 23 and 24, that will be deciding seeding three and four. And, of course, you don't want that because that means you're playing Navi or Envy. <laughs> so, unfortunately, it is what it is. But uh, I guess you just choose the lesser of two evils there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely not the place you want to be. Not I'd the say place heading you want to be. The but rather be at pressure. Worlds. Yeah, man. Rather be at Worlds, right? Oh, of right? course. Yeah. Absolutely. So, let's get into Splice and Kanga because that, to me, is a really interesting matchup. We've got a North American PPL team, which admittedly has played better than we all expected. I think absolutely they've played better expected. That's a big upset for them to even be in this position here. However, this is where my confidence, I think, starts to wane in them a little bit. Well, I mean, they've been scrimming against Kanga. Kanga's been boot camping yeah. in North America for about a week and a half before the event, uh, scrimming all the NA teams. So th they're, they're comfortable with each other. It's not like Kanga's coming in completely uh, unknown, like an unknown right. Yeah, and it, it almost feels like Kanga has the advantage here. Uh, I would say so, yeah. I mean, they, they've looked strong. I mean, they, they showed more dents in the armor in Fnatic than VP managed to. Right. A team that everyone was thinking would be strong coming into this. Right. That's an interesting aspect to it. And talk about aspect right there on your screen next to G Bunny and Shadow. You know, you mentioned a guy who's going to have to show up for Splice, and that's Vayne. Uh, Vayne also a big important part. We'll talk to him in a second. But on your screen, it's Mr. Ninim, who Nick has been a big, big in, uh, influx of energy into this team in Kanga. Absolutely. I mean, his last event was his first event. So for him to come in and have that type of impact, it's really speaking, I think, to his character and his confidence. This is probably my favorite play of the tournament, by the way. I got so <laughs> excited for that grenade to go It was nice. Window. I remember, like, the first time I saw anything be go through that window and, like, do damage. I was like, whoa, I didn't <laughs> even realize I was there. I don't know how I missed that. But, yeah, Ninim, I mean, he's been great for Kanga. He's kind of always been great for Kanga. He was, like, less of, of the question of greatness for me. I was really kind of looking at Corlin at this event because it's his first time with the squad playing in the starting five. And, you know, he's shown up as well. I think that's the biggest thing we had to ask about Kanga coming into this is they've lost such a juggernaut every single event this year. And they've managed to do okay. And this time it's just been different. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a longer boot camp. They they definitely attribute boot camps to a lot to their success. Yeah. But they have looked, I think, phenomenal. And apparently it's paid off for them. So let's get back to Splice Kresnik, mm -hmm. you know, kind of being around these guys very often. We take a look at Ricotta here, who has had his ups, had his downs. Uh, Vox kind of calls something like the Ricotta Theorem, where you can have so much aim that you don't really even need to think. You just aim yeah. so well that that's ending up being the difference maker in these matches. How do you feel about what he needs to do today and just overall his play of this tournament? Uh, Ricotta, as a player for Splice, has, has had to be the pop-off potential for them, because Shadow is, is really good. He's really consistent, but he doesn't, he doesn't have the insane He's crazy. not the playmaker. Yeah, exactly. He's not the playmaker like Ricotta is. Um, and Ricotta, I mean, you can see the ambush Strix he ran on Frozen Guard here was was so much value. Unlike the Strixes of my casuals that tried to do this, he actually it's, hits every shot. It's actually insane. When you think, have you ever tried to do that? 
Uh, not with Ambush. Usually with a Flare, I have Wall Hacks. He's <laughs> just trying to hit them right when they peek corners with the Ambush, using the speed from the stealth and the build to chain it. Just so much value. See, my question is... The quick scopes, <laughs> I'm just saying, have you ever tried that in Paladins? It's not as easy as you think. You do right, that, and right. it just... You don't get the scope, and he and has the perfect timing. that's what my question is. Is, is, is the spectator slash kill cam helping him out? Because I know in Call of Duty, the, call, the kill cam makes you look insane. <laughs> way better than you actually are. And I'm just wondering if that's the case in Paladins, because I've never really, like, made a conscious effort to try quick scoping people with Strix. Uh, it's very difficult. I've tried it, and it's not, uh, not anything to be trifled with. It is a skill, and it takes timing. It takes practice. And uh, it's not just a matter of letting go of your scope too quickly. Maybe it's what he's done is he did a, there's this old strategy from from Gears of War where you would put a little <laughs> dot in the dead center oh of your God. screen, so you wouldn't even really need to get that full scope animation off. You would just put the dot on your physical screen on top of what you wanted to hit. I mean, he's gonna get fined for making a mark <laughs> on the monitors in <laughs> here, know, so yeah. I hope not. I know, those are 240 hertz, baby. <laughs> Don't mess with those. Those are nice. Alienware sponsored right there. And uh, you know, as we head into a lot of great aim, obviously, but what's gonna be the difference maker for these two teams? Is it gonna be the drafting is it going to be the aim is it going to be some just pop-offs from these great players one thing that i think is, is going to is underrated in this set coming in is the is the maps right because yeah. splice they, they they specialize in the weirder in the weirder maps i know they play they scrim ice a lot i know we played them on well they won on it with yeah Red exactly yesterday. and the, yeah they they like fish market they, they like the weirder maps and they don't play jag if, if you load up a scrim on jaguar falls against them they just they just don't join They're like hey uh we always ban that can you change the map please uh, mm -hmm. So they have, th they don't practice these more common maps, but they're specializing in these weirder ones. So they can come out with, if they get, you know, the map advantage here, they can pick the maps they specialize in. Maybe Kanga's not ready for it. Nah, that's not the case. I mean, Kanga, uh, they're the ones that love these these wacky maps. Kind of for the reasons that you mm -hmm. almost said, like, they're the team that always has to come in. They always have to boot camp. So what they tell me is, like, man, you know, if we could just push this set to that game four, game five, where we don't have to play that Jag Falls. We don't have to play that Bright Marsh. We get to play stuff that no one else is really comfortable with, so we can just thrive on our instincts. So I don't think that's going to be much of an advantage here for Splice, actually. Ascension Peak, though, Nick. I mean, this is a map that is probably in the middle in ground between yeah. being casual and standard it's versus not timber. super not timber, obscure. But it's not Jag. It's not Jag. It's not timber. It's not Jag. Our own Paladin's language here. And as we take a look at Splice, G-Bunny, he was such a big part of this roster's energy yesterday. I noticed that from the beginning. He just was laughing, and he was he was turning to people who were focused, and he was like, give, give me a pound, man. He was like, give me those two. And Cres yeah, I'm making you do it too, Crescent, because you know what? Sometimes you have to do that to a guy. He's not ready. He's focused, but that lightens you up. It gets you going. It makes you feel, yeah, yeah, we could do this. We're here. Yeah, some of the other members of Splice, I know we're nervous coming into this. They're, you know, a lot of their first events, and G-Bunny's been a really big emotional leader for the team. He even is online as well. Uh, I know some of them were worried about uh, Vayne's performance coming in with it after his performance in the season. And yeah. uh, that emotional just drive, keeping them focused, keeping them happy, energetic, and communicating has been a big part of what, how they've been able to succeed. I mean, you're with Kanga a, a lot more than most people, Nick. And, and on their side, how does the kind of translation of the grueling nature or sometimes just the, the patience that it takes to do a tournament like this, six days long, playing in between days, taking a loss early, yeah. knowing the whole loser's bracket run is upon them. Are they feeling good about their chances today? This, yeah, absolutely in this matchup. They do scrim a lot, but it's Kanga kicking their ass, I think, 90% of the time is what they told me. So they're not super worried about this matchup. And I think one thing that's helped them uh, be sustained through a lot of these long tournaments is probably Hades, right? When you just get to play your game and kind of like almost stop thinking about it, right? He's going to do, I think, think most of the legwork for you. Yep. And then you, you sort of come and you bring your opinions and, and you do your VOD review, obviously. You do what you got to do here, but... Uh, I feel good about my boys. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be an interesting matchup for sure. One I've been excited about for a long time. So we're finally here in the draft, which is fantastic. Splice have a chance to do something crazy here. Yeah, the first ban on the Torvald makes mm. sense. I know Kanga has shown a really big preference for that uh, wow. in practice. Uh, Kanga returning with a pretty standard what you do in second pick, you remove the Makoa Khan, the most influential tanks right now. You yep. are the not power tanks. Here. The power tanks. We got a new word, baby. <laughs> You're gonna have to keep me updated with who's a power tank, all right? Ah, uh, sure, sure. So, hit, I mean, hit me in the DM cell. I at got this you. point, do they have to go for like an Ash Barrack, or they risk, you know, Pour having it taken away from in. them? Uh, taking Ash, I mean, on Ascension, she the has she can close the gap, right? Really, really run. effectively, and uh, not many other tanks can do it the way that she can. And having Leon with the dash distance build can. Heroes <laughs> incoming! What did that say? The map is split stone. It makes sense. I mean, it has the high ground difference and the big lanes. Don't hesitate uh, but Leon can cross a lot of distance, dashing from the high ground over the point or the high ground uh, on the side next to the well. 
Uh, she can cross a lot of distance, so she, she has a lot of value on this map with massive sight lines. So Ying grabbed up here as well as Maldamba. We see more Ying prioritization, Nick, and, and this seems to be the trend that will not stop, only continue here for these teams. No, certainly not. The Maldamba will be grabbed up. I'm still war thinking about these front lines and that, that conversation that always comes up with Ascension Peak Bring is the big you guns. can make it work with like a Ruckus or, or a you know Fortress Breaker Ash. So. I don't know. Man, I like the, the ruckus high, here. Yeah, high prioritization of we bands from both teams, fighters. really, on front lines. Ascension Peak up. definitely has a different conversation about front is... lines than most of the other maps. Are you kidding? I was born So right. interesting enough, it is Split Stone Quarry. Okay. Oh, okay. So this is not Ascension Peak. So this is a different map. Does that change what you guys are thinking? Who, who gets the edge now? Mm, I like Splice's draft right now. I like Splice's front line a lot better on Split Stone. I'll I agree. I it's agree. really, really solid for holding in that quarry area. And if you hold that area and zone mm. and line of sight the poke, you can get so much value just cycling on point. You're constantly getting cap time. They can't touch it because you're all sitting there to burn them when they get on the point. Just great value out of holding there. A all good right. Willow certainly changes things oh, slightly. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to say the Willow might have tilted things in the favor of Kanga, but we're going to let the players decide the fate of them to themselves today. It's time to get into set one of our final day at the PWC qualifier land. So let's send it to our casters, Gormizer and Vox. Thank you so much, Evan Gormizer. Vox here. And I was actually agreeing with the desk for a long time. Until I saw the Willow on Splitstone Quarry, yeah. Willow does have a huge impact. That's the difference maker for me right there. Obviously, you've got a lot of strong front line coming out of Splice. You've got a very strong composition so far. And then right at the end there, you have the AoE Denial, which could just throw a bit of a bit of a wrench into the works there, a bit of a spanner in the gearbox. But how do you feel about having the Willow going up against the Victor? That's something that we've kind of seen. If you can't get Leon, I feel like Victor is kind of like the second best to be able to take her out of the air. On Splitstone, I like it. The reason I like it on Splitstone is because you're far enough away that even though you're running shrapnel, Right, Victor's not throwing grenades at you up on the high ground. And Victor, sure, he's hit scan, but you're getting some decent fall off at that range, and you can maybe box out with him a little bit, right? It's not the worst matchup compared to a match where you're closer, you're taking full Victor damage. Well, as it is right now, the teams are Big in. Game. The game is starting. Nothing out of the ordinary coming through for these talents. It is all going to come down to how well you play, and the first shots I want to say are going towards Ricotta, as this is going to be an important match for both of these teams. Loser will go home. Carter then looking for some pressure, and you can see that that was just just slowing the pressure that Joel's is trying to get up on this high ground. Because making sure that they're not staying locked down too much, going to be hit by the Willow. There's a lot of focus going onto them from the Ruckus, from the Willow right now. It's good pressure, and it's allowing Kanga to get a little bit on the objective right. Even though Splice have the Inara, they're not finding too much in the way of control because of this dead zone here, Gormizer. And that is just the effect. Vayne not going to be able to do anywhere near as much. Probably one of the most aggressive Inara players that we typically see. Shadow actually finding first blood on the Cassie, being able to kill off Ninum on his classic Leon. Ooh. And now he's starting to pick it up. These shots are finding their home. Uh, one, two shots. Can't find the next one to Maldamba, but Shadow will now take a peripheral flank. Probably looking to get up to the high ground, or actually, no, finds a at least an angle onto Coland right now. That'll keep him distracted for a little while. It's not getting much in the way of a kill or a trade, but Kanga, they might think that the Cassie's still there and they've got to be very, very careful, but pressure down, down at the objective again, Vayne dead zoned. Got to run away, Gore, and that's just the power that Willow brings to the battlefield. This is part of the reason the wall is going to be very important, at least being able to try and shield some of the damage that's coming down from up here, but Corlin hasn't left this high ground. It's where Willow wants to live, and as long as he can keep Vayne off the point, you can see that 57% splice are able to match. Kanga just comes through and sweeps it right back in their own favor. Now, you still have Victor top of the damage charts, and that's going to allow that ultimate to come through very, very quickly, but here we go. Maldamba healing illusory rift from splice. They're trying to hit the gas pedal, but they're not really getting much right now. I mean, Attempt trying to hold on to the point as best they can. Ricotta looking for some damage down onto the Ash, and that's going to be big. Getting rid of Rhino right there gets rid of a lot of the pressure. Joel's is forced to rotate in, but that's not the position you want to really be in as a ruck. It's taking a little bit too much damage, but it's not going to bother him too much. Corland, on the other hand, is going to be feeling it all. Can't find the kill, though. Shadow finds Joel's looking for the barrack here, but Ninim just is being pressured out by these turrets. Ricotta finds Ninim, and that's Splice. Gore, they're going to take the first capture, and a big part of that was that early barrage right, and a big part of the reason why that was available to come up is because you've got Ricotta constantly boxing out against this Ruckus. You're effectively just being a bit of a damage sponge at that point if you're the Ruckus, and you're allowing this ult charge to come through so quickly, 94% already back on that ultimate. And we've been drawing comparisons, I want to say, between Victor and Drogo, specifically Grenade and that Dragon Spit being able to spread a lot of damage around corners and that's just another thing they have in common when you get a lot of damage down when you can spread it out like that you get your ult to the point where now we have actually two barrages in one round he has it charged up again if he needs it unfortunately his team has taken a little bit of a spill maybe too aggressive maybe just not the best positioning very good high ground control coming out from Kanga 
and it's going to be able to at least stall Splice a little bit. And that's just kind of what you expect with the Willow, right? And it's forced Splice back. Now, importantly, there was only G Bunny that went down at that point. You're not setting on this massive mid-round buy. I think maybe the Vixen might have, Ricardo might have. No, Seven Streak still, so still hasn't died. And let's take a look. G Bunny does come back with a Cauterize too, but right now we're seeing a lot of credits in pocket for the team of Splice, with one minute and 25 seconds on the clock. And unless they're going to try and force this one through with ultimates, they're really not going to get much efficacy about having that extra 300 neutral cap credits in pocket gore. The barrage right now, it might Ooh. find Joel's. Here comes the Illusory Rift. This might be what they need to push it through. And that's exactly going to start at least around the corner. Illusory Rift maybe a little bit too early, honestly, for the team as they're coming around. Everybody on Kanga just runs back to base. Oh, but Ricotta finds Chronix just through one sliver, being able to peek him right as he's going into the base as well. So a clean kill picked up, and that's going to at least stagger out Kanga to the point where they aren't able to truly engage. And you know what I love about the fact that uh, about Ricarda's victor right now? It's the, it's the relocation. You've always got your hustle available. You've always got that movement, and Ricarda's appearing where you least expect them because they're constantly trading positions, throwing out big bursts, moving back. There's some focus fire. There's another grenade. A lot of damage on Ash right now. Ricarda does get brought pretty low, but, I mean, there's a Ying here with life exchange to bring him back up again. Ash tries to get the kill, but is blocked off by an impasse. I mean, this is pretty much running. Ricotta's playing whack-a-mole. He's the mole. He's just popping out wherever he can. Unfortunately, Ninim has a giant hammer in the shape of an heirloom rifle, and right now it's going to be able to get rid of him oh, and Vayne, and potentially a couple more kills here. A lot of low health bars, but no big pressure coming out. One oh, more shot's all he Shadow. needs, and there's he's going to be able to get it. And that's perfect goal right there, because it keeps the respawn staggered. You won't have Splice coming back in to try and contest with their full health. You should be able to dismount this Inara right now, and we see that Os Rhino just playing the splash damage Ash is very, very good at that. That's an easy defense coming through right there. And that was a critical series of kills at just the right moment, because if we'd seen the respawns come through from a Splice, then we would have had a Victor back with, you know, their second tier offensive item. Then we would have had all of this mid round by pressure come on through. Oh, yeah. Now that is going to be contributed in the next round, but do remember that ultimates like Illusory Rift were actually popped towards the end of that push, and Splice didn't really get much for it. Ooh, a gorgeous shot being able to catch Ninim at the very end of his dash as well. So Shadow is dialed in on this Cassie right This is a Cassie magnetic right, right there. And I mean, he finds those next two shots as well. It starts missing after that point. Hey, but he's 5, this. 1, and 4. He's keeping up and he's doing well. Gore, I love this increase, uh, this inclusion of Fatal Sign right here. This is a card which we rarely see in Cassie loadouts, right? We've got Connects in there, sure. Somersault, Territorial for the disengaged cooldown because you're running big game. But Fatal Sign just increasing that reload speed for 5 seconds after getting elimination kind of turns Cassie into a bit of a snowball machine because all of a sudden that kind of gap in the action when you do have to wait and stop firing is decreased. And look at that already. Seismic crash to shut down Ost Rhino. Shadow finds more big damage on the Joels. Look at the value of big game Cassie versus that ruckus that just can't block the disengage shot. And being able to find it, like you had said, with that reload speed, you essentially have 12 shots in your loadout or in your clip that you can kind of go through. And it's very impressive to be able to burst through it. And as of right now, Rhino, as though he is back, it's still not going to be too much to be able to get him onto the point. He's going to go oh, for I the like ult. That. He's going to be able to find a lot of control. Low health bars all around on the side of Splice. And that's going to be two kills picked up clean. Looking for three and four right here. Ricotta has nowhere to run. Oh, that's perfect. That's a full cleanup coming through with only the Ying left alive right now on the side of Splice. Currently on a 10 streak is its aspect. And they'll retreat for the time being. Safe saving some of that. Look at the Illusory Rift charge though, sitting at 100%, scout very close, and here's the Barrack Dome Shield as well. It's 1-1, one, one. no comeback mechanic right now. Kanga tried to zone, but they are being forced back, Gore, and they've got to make a retreat before they start losing members. I mean, rolling forward, looking for the kills. This is actually going to be important. If you can get rid of Corland, I think you alleviate a lot of the pressure, at least trying to get rid of him. And that's going to be the Illusory Rift, something they've been popping every time they want to get oh, aggressive. But it's 87 to 30. So much has to go right here for Splice. They need to start finding these kills. Rhino's the first on the chopping block, but he still hasn't gone down. Really importantly, though, you did lose Corland. You got to back it off. But Kanga got 87% from that capture kind of control right there. Splice, they're about to be able to equal it. But by the time that they get close to it, and by the time that we're forced into contest, you will see this Willow return to the battlefield. Frag Grenade doesn't find Joel's. They're able to escape. Dome Shield goes down for the security and there is no assert dominance and that'll be Ash falling to Shadow and Barrage from Ricotta. Gonna have the enlightenment come through, find no kills. Shadow being able to pick up Rhino though, and that's gonna be a huge pickup. Nice grenade gonna be able to come in. Corlin as well as Joel's both getting taken down. Vayne credit for the kills, but all the damage is coming from the side. Ricotta is making sure to stack it on, and they're gonna be able to come through from the brink of potentially losing that point.
and take it away from Kanga. And right now we've just got this really good damage synergy between Splice for these point control compositions, right? You've got a Nara who basically takes the stress off of everybody else on the objective. A very strong point hold with a Nara and Barak and Yang, right? But what you've got is you've got very strong anti-tank pressure from Cassie running big game, and you've got excellent anti-personnel pressure from Ricarda right now. Anti-DPS with these frag grenades which will seriously mess up a Lian or a Willow if a couple of them hit in a row. And it's really doing the numbers over Kangi Esports right now. They haven't found equivalent pressure, especially onto the backline damage dealers, and that's what it seems to be making the difference. Throughout the fall split, part of the reason we would ever see Splice seem like they were in, in a successful round, right? If they were able to win a map or if they were having a good round, it was always the collaboration between right. Shadow and Ricotta. Do you think that's going to play just as big a role here? I mean, we've seen them have their moments individually left and right, but do you think it is going to come down to the fact that they have to work together for this one? They have to be able to find those combos to make it work? I think it's a very important win condition, but it's only part of the win condition for me. It's like that needs to be the standard right now, is that these two work together excellently. One of the big win conditions coming into this, I think, is actually the fact that Vayne's performance so far has been a little bit over all over the place. Either very good or just kind of a non-factor in a lot of these fights. Now, so far in this game, Vayne has been a big impact play on the Inara, especially with that kill on the corner in the last round, and as Seismic Crash comes through, is actually avoided by Osreiner, but Chronix goes down, and that is huge score. Corlin's up in the air, though, and he's causing so much havoc from above, being able to rain down these Can't shots. The kill he's the Vayne, finding though. the damage, but never a kill, and that has been the big issue, I think, we've seen from pretty much any of the blasters this week. It's just, can you close it out? And so far, the answer for Corlin has been no. Right, and who are you relying on to get that final kill or that final punch. It's a Leon, but if the Leon is either dead or doesn't have a line of sight as well, you're in trouble. This is where flanks really start to come into play, Gore, when you're running into a composition with strong backline pressure from Splice. It helps to have somebody that can go in and dive and get that kill. Maybe the any maybe an Eevee, maybe an Androx is on a map like this, probably not the Talus, but right now Ricardo's in a perfect position to land a grenade around the corner onto Ninim. Can't find the kill. And I like the disengage call from Splice here. They're not overextending. They're waiting for their respawns. If they can get their Inara back in time, they do have the chance to contest. Especially between two close teams like this. Five seconds going 2-2 is not the end of the world for you. Again, a lot of teams, depending on the matchup, will look at this map. I want to say yeah. similarly to Ice Mines, where it's just like you're not looking at converting. It you're is one of the, the most fights. difficult ones too, right? It's got a very long conversion. You've got this kind of just really shoot and fish in a barrel approach to the defense where you can stand on the high ground as a defender. Kind of bright marsh, but marshy to a degree, but it's even more so because it's around this elbow corner. So as soon as you step out to be able to put yourself in contest, you do end up in a lot of trouble. But this is another clutch play from Vayne right there. Able to uh, get a couple of kills, does end up dying posthumously to Corlin's seedlings, but still splice in the lead right now. Two to two in control of the economy as well. It's Aspect yet to die, and let's take a look at those items before we do end up going right out. And you can see that the luxury picks are starting to come online now. You've got the Cauterized Threes online on three members of Splice. You've got the Wrecker Three on Shadow as well. Now you're looking towards the Blast Shields, right? You're looking for that damage reduction to make Coolant even less effective, and he's had difficulty finding kills already. I mean, the thing that caught my eye is, you remember how he had two barrages in round one? Well, now he has Morale Boost too as well, so I'm looking at Ricotta to be consistently at the top of the damage charts, especially with how often his ult should be coming up, trying to match the Ying, trying to match the Willow as well, and how often they can try and pop that. But as of right now, it's 18% to 3. Also, Everyone kind of avoiding the point. Right, I was going to say that, Gore. Look at this. You can obviously see that it's Splice in pretty much, uh, excuse me, Kanga Esports in pretty much good control of the objective, but Splice got 18%, and then it was Ninim sitting right around the peripheral of that point on the Leon, but just not setting a toe into the objective area to actually just start that capture timer going. And I think that might have lost them, you know, at least 18, 20% right there. That might come down to be the difference as it is 69% and rising for Kanga Esports. There's the assert dominance. They're trying to hold on. Here goes the gas pedal as Willow enters Fae Flight. And flying right over the drill, looking for Rakata immediately. The perfect target to try and find, but he's just going to be able to run undercover, stay hidden. And this is going to be the problem with Splitstone Quarry when you're playing Willow. 342 health tries to stay alive, will be alive unless Ying can do something to about it, but the damage is just not in Oh, you've got to hit favorite. that shot. Oh, that's such a critical moment. If Corland hits that direct impact onto Ying, removes the healing from Splice in that second, Kanga Esports get the point. Then they threw everything at it, right? They threw the Dread Sub at it. You had a Fae Flight going onto a Victor in a Barrage, who's a vulnerable target, and the Blast Shield's really starting to come into play. Just enough damage reduction that you aren't getting these kills coming through. Well, Ninim finally picks up Ricotta, but in that time, 96 to uh -oh. 90%. G-Bunny going down as well. That means we're Splice here are going to be fighting 
fighting a 3v5, and if Vayne goes down, that might just end it overtime taking down. They have to touch onto the point, but Ninim is finding so many good shots. He gets rid of Shadow. He's about to get rid of Vayne if things go right, and that should be the overtime done. And critically, as Kanga do get the objective gore, now leading 3-2 to two with a chance for an objective push, a couple of things come up. First of all, we've talked about Dead Zone anti-heal so far, but critically as well, Leon with Death and Taxes is really helping augment that pressure onto the Inara, just shutting them down. And there's no aggro frontline pressure to really suppress them right now. You're looking at Barrack and Inara, you're not looking at anybody who has a great deal of control and suppression. Secondary, Kanga Esports have a Fae Flight, and that's difficult to hold against, actually, because what we talked about, that line of sight break, that ability to hold on this map, as you can see Colin going up into the air right now, this whole L-shaped elbow right here can be completely bypassed by Willow just going straight up into the air, and that could be a base-breaking factor. And one of the things we've looked at, the high ground, Willow is able to get up there just as easily as anybody from Splice, and that's where she likes to live. But Corlin will get taken down there by Ricotta. That's going to make a big difference in the pressure that Kanga can, can apply, especially when you get grenades and barrages like this into the corner. He gets stunned out. It's not going to be enough to find the kill on his own, but with his team, they're going to be able to find a clean three, clean four, clean five as they come through. Corlin, the only one left as he had respawned just slightly before. Quick note as well, I'm not sure about Ninim's enlightenment there. I heard the kneel kind of voice line come through at the end there. At that point, you've already lost Corlin, right? Your, your push is going to fail. You need to regroup. You're probably not getting out of there alive with all of Splice bearing down on you. It seems more sensible to keep that ultimate in the tanks. We'll have to see how quickly that does charge. Wow, is at 9% goal on that respawn? Already at 44% for Ninim right now, but Ricarda sitting at 70% on that barrage. Another big grenade, 85% goal. 15 from one grenade right there. My goodness. I mean, another five, as long as he hits at least one target, he's going to be able to keep chunking that ult up. And again, you're looking at someone who is looking to buy that morale boost, continually going forward with his ult charge, 98%. He only has the morale boost too right now, but those 900 credits he just got, I expect to see, especially with the way this round is going, Splice come into the next round ready and prepared for Kanga. Now with 30 seconds left, I want to see Kanga go for this right now. They're getting close to charging their ultimates up. The Fate Flight is the lowest, and that's the really critical one for me right now, Gore. That's the one which they do need to get up and rolling. It's already at 68% though, thanks to Courland, and now they're looking to re-engage towards that objective doing whatever they can. Breaking around this corner is going to be difficult as well as over 50% of the push needs to be made essentially in overtime here, but they're going to be able to touch. They're going to be able to get that timer. It is just going to be a matter of pushing and pressure. Corland, a lot is going on to his shoulders to make sure this works right. A couple of kills from him and Ninim will make the biggest difference here for Kanga. Well, G-Bunny's already gone down. Ricardo in Shadow 2. That's the damage away from Splice right now. If they can stagger out this Ying pick or just force her back into base, it'll buy a lot of time. A little bit of time wasted on this push as well in overtime, thanks to Vayne's contest as Inara. That's kind of to be expected now, but that will allow Ninim to reposition to this peripheral left-hand side and allow Corlin to get up onto the high ground on the right on this push score. It's all about positioning right here. Five volts versus five volts. Hexafire at the ready. Dread Serpent 2. Dome Shield to mitigate everything. Who'll be the first one to engage? As Shadow's about to go down, and Illusory Risk comes through to save, but that's the dead zone gore. And Rhino being able to find the credit for the kill. Corlin's up in the air. They're looking for the end. They're pushing it in as of right now. Dome Shield goes up. Dome Shield goes down. Hexafire is out and the kills are coming in. Ricotta, G-Bunny going down. Ninim is getting traded out, but is it going to be enough? Overtime still ticking. They're walking it forward every step they can and with Vayne goes down, that might just be the end for Splice, but they're holding on as best they can. Scouts out, but the kills are there for Corlin and Kanga takes game number one. Double kill to close out the dead zone that let it happen. Willow was the difference maker. Hands down that game goal right there at the end on the push. That's what opened up the potential for Kank Esports to get that payload through thanks to Fae Flight, thanks to the dead zone. 100% anti-heal mitigating the Illusory Rift ultimate, which has been so pivotal for a lot of teams so far during this tournament. Excellent play and excellent drafting overall from Kanga, but I can't help but remark, lack of aggro tank really hurt Splice. And there were so many moments, at least for me, where it felt like that Illusory Rift might have been popped a little bit either too early or too late when it was necessary or ne unnecessarily for maybe only one person on the team as opposed to everybody. Mm -hmm. But hey, the desk is going to be able to break down everything we have for that. That's the end of game one. So let's go ahead and throw it back to Evan and the boys to walk us through it. Thanks, Gore. Well, interesting game there and uh, turned its head right at the midway mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Splice were looking good and then Kanga bounced back. They take game one. Mm -hmm. Pretty surprising to me. I love seeing that 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 turnaround there. I mean, on the defense, on the defense, and we talk about so many teams struggle to shift gears and like do that defensive dance that time around. 
the big difference maker, I think for me, was that Willow and just so much of that innate anti heal. You mentioned Ying's early game, but I mean, with mm -hmm. Leon, with a Willow, their their anti heal doesn't get too much stronger than it does right out of the gate, in my opinion. Yeah. Krasnick, what do you see? What was the turning point? Uh, the turning, well, Kanga started managing their alts significantly better after the second mid. The second mid, they, they won the fight initially, but they used everything. Mm. They used uh, Enlightenment, they used the Hexafire, they used the Assert Dominance, all of that at once, and then, but they had no cap time. Right. So Spice is just like, oh, we'll just mosey Boy. on over, mosey on mosey. back over to the point, <laughs> use the alts we saved. Yeah. Um, but much later in the fight, they saved the Assert Dominance till they had kind of let the fight stagnate a little more, mm -hmm. slowed down the cap time. Once they used it, they didn't need to zone them anymore, mm. and uh, they were able to take the mid-fight and the win from that. It was a really incredible performance. Ricotta as well, had a great game, but mm -hmm. couldn't get it done. He held off those lines of sight nicely, so really it was a story of how Ninum and Corlin could play around it, and they did show up damage-wise, actually matching the victor, but there were two of them this time, right. and so uh, incredible performances from the damage dealers on the side of Kanga. It puts them in, a dri in the driver's seat in this set now with That's one big. game left. Uh, before they're actually moving on and sending Splice home. And moving on to their pick, too. Yeah. Their map pick as well. So uh, they're going to be pretty confident, I think, coming into a map that they've practiced, they're ready for, that they want against Splice. Corlin MVP, Nick, you were pretty confident in Ninum's performance. Corlin, did he give you the confidence heading into game two? At the end of the game, yeah. At the start, I'm kind of like, oh, what's he really, what's he really accomplishing here? I'm seeing, you know, Ninum's getting in there, but some good Fae flights later on. That was big. Little hesitation moments as well, but I, you know, maybe that's just you know the first game out. I don't think Kanga expects to be hit this hard by Splice as well. So now that this first game has gone their way, and you mentioned it is, you know, going to be Kanga's map pick going to the second one. That's huge. At this point, I don't want to jinx anything, so I'm not going to go down any further down that trail. But I'm feeling good. Well, we have a uh, extremely interesting game bang, bang. too about to show up. Nice little capstone as well to show some great play. And very deserving of Corlin getting the Steel Series MVP. Nine kills, 11 assists, right. but 121,000 damage. And the anti heal against the Inara, that was a big pick. Yeah, he adapted really well as the yeah. game went on. Uh, he, he noticed like where they were backing up to, and he just said, I don't need to peek yeah. The, yeah. these angles. I don't need to eat this victor damage. I can just zone the the one area I see them kinding to, and he just got tons of free damage kills. Yeah. Yeah. Hit that the one needed. combo that was, it's almost like through two doors of Quarry to yeah. like the enemy corner, and that was massive. He actually got a kill from that and kept the Nara back there. Now, Splice going into this, my first thought is this team is a team of momentum and they had it going into this set and they had it going yeah. into the first two rounds and the and the third round i was worried dude but i was like then oh. <laughs> they lost it and, and you see a little bit on aspects phase but now it looks like okay now we have to get this back we had this thing yeah. we've lost it now we're facing elimination again what does this mean heading into game two is this a is this a more of a nerve-wracking thing watching Splice as a viewer, as a fan now? I mean, Splice have Splice have started sets down and turned it around. You know, they've come so close so often, and even recently they've, they've won against Renegades, and so they've yeah. got, they passed that um, that barrier of winning a set against yeah. a team that they're supposed to lose to. So I could I could see them turning around. I think it's going to be a lot on, on Bunny kind of keeping up that energy, being like, hey, guys, I know we lost, but you got to start you got to start talking again. Yeah, he's yeah. got to do it, right? I mean, that's really going to be his role for game two. I think this was the perfect game one to win for Kanka. It splices map pick. It was not easy, so they come in. They have that confidence. I know they have that, you know, probably overconfident in this set. So they kind of get their butts kicked a little bit in this first game, but they don't lose it at the end of the day. So that's going to, I think, wake them up for game number two to the point where they can just finish strong. Well, this is going to be an interesting one here. Kanga have the map pick. They won on Splice's pick. It was close, but they couldn't pull it together in terms of Splice getting the W. Kanga Esports were expected to be a little bit of a favorite here and didn't look that way in the early rounds of Game 1. Now, Frozen Guard, a map that we've seen a ton of times in this tournament, is going to be the map where it could all decide Kanga's future and Splice's as well. Corlin and the boys getting ready. The black and orange versus the black and yellow. We're going to have that later on, too. Fanatic and SSG. That'll be interesting. Yeah. I loved Vox casting saying, and the boys <laughs> of black and orange get the win. And it was the, both teams have black and orange. And I was like, man, that's a real safety net of oh, a cast, do they? isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> you can do that with Good his eyes them. closed practically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I loved it. Every two two games in a row, he closed like that. And I was like, fantastic. I, uh, I actually, th this pick, it could be good for Splice, too. I mean, they won yeah, on this map man. against Renegades. Uh, and they like they like their snipers. Yeah. They like their rotation pokey play. Yeah. Uh, I could see it being strong for them. Yeah, I, I think so too. Splice here now with the first pick in this position and the first ban as well. Oh. The Torvald and the Makoa, they go early, guys. Still more frontline bans? Um, 
I could see I could see mid ranger bans maybe if they okay. want to limit the yeah, man. yeah like Leon Leon Cassie Victor the the yep. best mid rangers right now, um, just to limit the choices that Kanga has you know because if Spice gets one and then Kanga gets two it's I love these words, <laughs> the mid rangers the power tanks. It's just yep. it's you combine it and you kind of get the drafting. power rangers. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I, I, the, Cassie so Leon, who are the power mid rangers? The power Cassie Leon Victor. Those are the power rangers right the now. The power rangers. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, the, the pretty pretty expected. I'd say bands. Like I said before, Kanga really likes Torvald Splice. Uh, I actually G Bunny told me uh, before their game against VP, like, oh, we're not afraid of Torvald. And Good. then they lost to Torvald. Yeah. And now they've been banning Bad. Torvald basically every, <laughs> every time really since then. First pick this. Interesting. This is an interesting first pick here. It's Cassie. shadows, but but you you know what it is? It's flexibility. Both both damage dealers on the blaster side are available, so you don't have to worry about that. You have a plethora of tanks, and this is something that, like you said, a mid ranger power ranger here what on this map. What happens if Kanga just grab a Nando here? I think they're grabbing Cassie because if they they're thinking, oh, if we first pick a Nara, they'll grab an aggro tank and they'll grab Cassie and just big game our Nara off the point. Right. I think maybe they're looking to just poke the Nara out, control the wall side. Just just zone them off the point and then retake afterwards. And could this be VOD review? Could this be tape? Could this be, hey, we know they kind of lean towards this. We've seen Come on, some great performances here with the cast. We know it's a comfort secondary pick. They're going to grab the victor and the Ash, Champions it looks like. Are made by the Ash is fantastic choose. on this map, especially the against the style that uh, Splice want to play. Because you can you can just poke them from the side, and at any time, if you're like, "Hey guys, we really need to get rid of some of the pressure," it's like, "All right, I'll just teleport across the map and mm. uh, be invincible in their face." You know, what are they going to do at that point? They True. have to rotate into angles they don't want to be in, especially against a Victor. Maybe this is also just Ricotta saying that I could flex on a little bit more than you can here, because blasters aren't really. I know I said they're available, but they're not really prioritized here on Frozen Guard as wild. much as other maps. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's Ricotta knows I can snipe. I could Talus, I could do a couple of different things here. So let's save that towards the end of the draft and Kanga won't be able to respond as well. They will have that last pick, but at least not three picks to be able to counter us. Yeah, Splice, uh, most teams try to save their DPS for the last pick. That's why even like Kanga right now, yeah. like, yeah, they already have Ying. You could save Damba for last and get a better damage pick, but it's better to be able to react to right. Splice's Absolutely. last two picks here. Absolutely, I agree with that completely. Ruck is really solid on this map as well, especially against uh, potential Feast snipers or the backline mid-range uh, DPS. I know. They could just... You don't feel like it's playing a little bit into big game? Yeah. I don't think, I don't I'll think Ruckus suffers too to much from big game. He's first. the perfect tank to get hit by big game because he's not too much health to where it's mm -hmm. going to be insane amounts of bonus damage. Mm -hmm. And he's also got the shielding as well, yeah. which can augment a couple of those shots. Yeah, maybe one or two. And 1,500 damage in his three rockets, which right. just no DPS is like, oh, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'll I'll go go with that. that <laughs> yeah, I got plenty of help outside of that. Fernando taken here, and what's the dip? What's the last pick, guys? What are we thinking? Is this a sniper? Or is this, is this a flank? I, I was assuming the talons. It's hovered now. It's gonna be hard, it, depending on the build that um, I'm assuming. I'm assuming Nanum's gonna be on the together. Victor, um, that they have. It might be harder for the talons to take him out, especially with the the peel they have with the ruckus burst damage, the ash yeah, potential. Man. I hope he goes talons because I think they'll lose if they do. <laughs> <laughs> No bias I, here on the desk. With a skin, and you know what? I'm actually. So hard, dude, but what do you do after this, right? Do you go sniper? Easy. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't go sniper into the tower. They'd have to play so death ball around the tower, so I, uh, around the sniper. I feel like it doesn't play into their composition. I mean, we're starting to get deeper into these well, yeah, drafts here because uh, there's n if you're not considering Drogos or Willow, which clearly not a priority. Mm -hmm. I could see them taking their own flanker. I mean, Andro's still available. Let's not forget that. I could see. I could see maybe Zin, kind of like what Renegades had. Zin would be a good idea. Mind is in. Not sure the exact hero pool of the, um, yeah, I'm the assuming Corlin. Yeah, the scary thing is that I don't think anyone's super comfortable in their carry roles for Kanga. This, uh, this is the thing that made sense initially to mm -hmm. me. But it's, they could, they could fall under the pressure. They do have Ash, which is 100% the best tank to have into a sniper. Um, just because she can cross those sight lines so fast. Nando, he can, I mean, shield through it, but then you don't have a shield when you're in. You don't right. have your cooldowns that you need mm, right. to win the fight. Yeah. Um, I, I could see it being strong, but it, it's going to depend a lot on how tight Kanga plays here. They, they need to protect Strix. Hmm. Interesting. Nidim's a beast on it, man. I, I definitely will give him that. Well, it's going to be an interesting one. It could be Kanga moving on and sending Splice home or Splice tying it up. Sending this to a game three here in our last day of the qualifiers. Let's send it back to your casters, Vox and Gormizer on the call. There's so much, I think, that comes down to the Strix and how it performs. Very similar to something we actually got to see out of Splice yesterday. 
as to whether or not he will make the difference. And Vox, when you were sitting there chanting Zen, how do you feel about the Strix? I don't like the Strix, but Kanga don't play flanks, so, you know, it's not totally surprising. I think <laughs> the Strix is a little bit vulnerable here, right? But it depends who gets that early pressure, right? The big thing for me, if Splice can close the gap and get close to Kanga without Kanga dismounting them, without Kanga bringing them to half health, they win the fight. If Kanga are able to keep them at bay, they don't win the fight. Kanga win the fight. And we have a cosplay supreme here on the victim with a look at things. I love these little little bits of title info coming through in 1.7. Out goes the flare, looking for where people are going to be. Left side, wall side. Cassie's trying to get in a position. And now we're on the objective. And here comes the Skadrin. Will anybody find first damage on the Ricotta? 1,200 to the face. And back goes Talus. I mean, immediately pushing out Ricotta is going to be big for them here. Ricotta should know how to play against the Sniper since he was the Sniper yesterday, what but it's hope. going to be very difficult to get to someone like Corland, especially when he's not only hitting all these shots, but also when he has kind of the safety net of Kanga around him. He's not being left alone, and so trying to get back there and just find that elimination is not going to be an easy task. Here's the thing, right, though. As long as Ricotta can continually get out of the fight, it doesn't matter that he's not getting the kill because all of Kanga have to be continually aware of the fact that there is this Talus who's going to do that and just ring the bell with headshots there for you. <laughs> and if you're not continually aware of the fact that there is this Talus, then you're going to die. So realistically, Kanga Esports just have a harder execution threshold. They're playing into a Nara who caps the objective for free for Splice for the way 1 minute and 56 in, and that's Splice already having cap. The whole thing about this is it's just distraction factor versus, yeah. stri versus snipers again. We saw it yesterday with um, Team Cryptic running an Eevee or running a Knessa into Eevee. And if, if your sniper isn't just shooting the point, then you're just losing out on free damage. So I have a question for you. Last game, one of the things you were talking about was kind of a lack of aggressive frontline from Splice and how that wasn't really letting them fight back onto the point as much as Kanga. It did end up helping them, I think, in the long run, at least at the beginning of the game. Towards the tail end of it, you could definitely see that Inara wasn't having the, the impact they really needed. Yeah, well, Do you think adding for Fernando has kind of supplemented that? Yeah, Fernando's just security for them right here. It's useful. They've got a, uh, if they really need to hold down an objective, they've got the Immortal as well. Fernando just provides a huge amount for them. I do agree that playing into a sniper, the Ash would have been a little bit better, and you can see why Kanga Esports kind of set themselves up with the Ash first pick in their part of the draft, second pick overall, just to make sure that they had that security. But other than that, you know, it, it's it's still an aggro frontline. It's one of the best aggro frontlines. I think the most winning aggro frontline right now. So a good pick overall. And look at that damage coming out from Call and just trying to keep everybody at bay. As now Splice have a really tall order trying to push through these lines of sight to get to that payload where Kanga Esports uh, they have high ground control, they have line of sight angles, and they have a flare to reveal everybody. It's really, really difficult to deal with. Most of the damage is falling in favor of Kanga here. They're able to find a lot of poke in this nice, wide open area. Perfect for a Victor for a Strix, but that is going to be the Illusory Rift popped and the aggression coming out. Splice looking for kill one, and they're going to be able to find it. They get rid of Corlin, but Rhino going to pop the Assert Dominus just to continue fighting in this little corridor. Still forced to retreat, but he blocks the dash. G-Bunny going to get aggressive. Still nothing big coming out of it. Just making sure that they hold some control. Oss Rhino still alive. Here comes the Immortal Hexfire cancelled immediately because of that immunity and G-Bunny being focused down. They know that the shield is surely going to come up in just a second. They now being forced out as well. G-Bunny pops the shield on down, does have an illusion to help him out, but Ninim finds its aspect and that'll be the end of that push attempt for this time, I think, Gormizer. Really good ultimate coordination. I love the trigger discipline of Jaws right there. I recognize there's an immortal. If I stand here, I can reduce, sure, I can reduce everybody to 1500 health, right, the immortal threshold. But after that, I'm just taking free damage. Let me back out of here, reposition, and make sure that it puts Splice on the back foot. A couple of big ults used as well. So Splice are going to come into this, not necessarily barren, but definitely stripped of some of the clothes, or of not clothes, some of the ults that they have coming through. Oh my god, Gormizer, they, uh, we're on I a mean, PG-13 Yeah, you know right what's here. going on here for Splice, though. Good heck. They're feeling themselves. Either way, not as confident, I want to say. I mean, especially after the way the last game went. You capture the first point, and then you get a defense, and you're like, okay, well, it's 1-1. One, one. You can capture the second point, and they're like, cool, it goes 2-2. Two, two. Oh That's where things get shaky just because Kanga have been showing that strength, and this is something that I think will not be easy to replicate from G-Bunny. Yeah, yes and no, but it's this pincer aspect, right? G-Bunny is effectively flank muck too with a 4,600 health pool for Splice. And you just pincer between Ricardo and you pincer between G-Bunny. Shadow is putting consistent damage out from long range. And Kanga Esports, if, if they rotate along that wall and they don't have anywhere to peel back, right? And that was a really big issue. They they were pincer between Cassie, Fernando, and Talos from three different directions. They didn't have the ability to rotate backwards towards their base and retreat anywhere. 
it's it's a really difficult thing for Kenny Esports to play around. They've got to open up with a big kill, otherwise this is going to happen. And Kulon this time around hasn't been looking for Ricardo. Down goes the Runa Travel, out comes the damage, there goes the Flashbang, teleport back. Barrage ends oh. up hitting though, and Ninim gets the kill. Being able to get rid of Ricardo this early on is going to make a huge swing for them because that pressure is now alleviated. Shadow as well going down. G-Bunny is gone because he just takes the brunt of the remainder of that Barrage. And now Kanga are sitting in the driver's seat. If they can pick off Aspect, especially this Staggered, it would be very big, but an unfortunate grenade toss bounces it right into the snowbank, right grenade. on the right side. And then uh, we swarmed up the throwing arm right there. A few headshots ring the bell though onto Vayne. So Inara getting just chipped down a little bit. There's only one illusion healing them up as well. So Vayne's not getting a lot of consistent healing coming through right now. There we go. Ying with the supplemental healing. Vayne tries to make their way on through. It's 96% to Kanga. Can anybody touch? Illusory Rift was available. They had everything they might have needed, except for a body on the point, which is Movement. the only thing that really needed to get you in there. And that is credit to Kanga for dismounting as early as they did. Absolutely. And let's talk about why that's so effective when you're playing against an NR, right? I was a little bit surprised that the Fernando wasn't able to dash on in, but they probably ended up coming through this sort of mines area where we just saw Ash and use their dash to kind of try and make their way through. If you dismount Inara early, Inara's great for this point when she's on the objective. But if she <laughs> dies and if she gets dismounted early, it is the longest walk of your life back to the point fight gore and it's just a very difficult journey to be able to get back in contest you need that aggro attack to be able to make the distance close that gap that just didn't happen so kanga esports coming out ahead right now coolant finding a big kill on a vein right there that'll open up the push completely looks to line up shots behind this big seed shield as well onto cassie and the flare all the while is just making it so difficult for anybody to get a peak advantage onto this sniper. And I think Corlin is showcasing, there's two reasons that we would see sniper, right? Kinesa, it's gonna be the Eagle Eye, you have that charge time, you find the head, uh, the headshots, but for Strix, it is the fact that you can just fling into your scope, find a shot, 1200 damage every single time, it's gonna be consistent, and that damage might mean so much to the team, and that's why he is such a primary target to get rid of him, and Ninim are going to be huge, and right now it's just going to be kills, kills, kills here for Splice, as they eliminate all but one lonely Maldamba, who then takes a, a spin completely down to Frozen Guard, if I'm not mistaken. And that's a good decision right there, because you, you, need to, you need to get yourself out of that fight. You need to regroup. You've got 58 seconds left. You've got time for at least one more decent push, maybe with some respawn... Uh, reinforcements coming through. One of the really big things, though, that we're noticing right now, Splice are in a better position to be able to put up a defense. But when their Talus is corralled in base like they were just previously, without the use of something like an Illusory Rift and a massive dive to try and displace the Sniper, Talus is very ineffective. It is going to be unfortunate for him. Ricotta finding a kill there, though. It is a lot of damage if you can get close enough and you can find it all. He has been making either the play or the not play, depending on where you want to see. It's something we've been talking about flanks a lot this week. And I'm kind of, you know, while we have 20 seconds left, wondering, yeah. do you think this is ride or die on the Talus, or do you think they can rely on the Cassie in case Ricotta can't perform? Every flank besides Talus, who's at a 50% win rate, has above a 50% win rate right now. Gore. Flanks straight up are one of the deciding factors of these games, and I think that it really does ride or die on Ricotta. If Ricotta can't pincer and end up finding these cleanup kills versus the Strix, versus the Victor, or at least just distract so G Bunny can run in and get these massive collateral damage fireballs, these big, big, big bonus damage shots, then it's not going to work out very well for the side of Spice. So there's a lot riding on how this Talus performs, and we might see that win rate increase, right? This is the map to do it. It's a very flat map. And here is Ricarda. There's the Illusory Rift on this first defensive push. The shield goes up, the Fernando dives on in, but it's a big dive and a lot of resources that I ended up being elapsed just to make that possible. Talus sucks on defense. Well, that was your INAP instant replay. It was at least Talus being able to find something. And again, focusing on Corlin's probably Case his point. job as of right now. Antediluvian and Guts, I think, are the two cards that stand out the most, at least keeping himself alive as well as trying to get some anti-heal out. But, I mean, his items are all over the place. Quite literally, he has one of everything except a record two, which is going to give him maybe a little bit more boxing potential against Joel's. But everyone's looking for him. They yeah. want to know where is this Talus? He is the hit of the town. Spotted him. And that makes it a lot harder Mystery to get power. in. Power. Colin's being found. Here comes the damage. Oh, what a dread serpent barrage. Seismic crash comes through a second too late for the side of Splice. And G Bunny tries to keep Ricardo alive with Immortal, but it's too little too late, Gore. I can't genuinely can't think of anything that would probably feel worse as a Talus than true powering into that kind of scenario. Vayne now probably having the worst feeling as an R other than having to walk back to the point. And that is just 
being no alone one to on help point. You. No yep. one is around. No damage, no healing, and you are going to get displaced. That is going to be 78% though picked up for Splice. Illusory Rift still on board, so they still have some control. And look at this. They know where Ricardo is. They're distracted with him right now. G-Bunny gets very close back at this point. Look as well at Vayne, the Inara. Nobody's focusing on dismounts because Kanga Esports are so aware of this Talus, and that's going to be the Illusory Rift pop. They want to get back in. It's 78% of Rising Gore to Kanga Esports. Can Splice find a way to touch? It's going to be all up onto this Anara. Is it going to be able to matter? Hexafire is going to come through. Blocked by the wall. Not going to find any kills. A lot of damage, but it's not enough to close anything out. Barrage oh, comes barrage. down. Minim gets rid of Vayne. And now that 93 is looking like a bigger number. But Joel's is incredibly low. And Talus spots him out. He's going in for it. The shield is gone. And Joel's is going to go down. And that's the power of Rakitu. Talus there, folks. That SMG just shreds from close range. In goes Chronix. Touches and gets melted by Ricardo. Will this be the triple kill? It's Aspect steals it away. And overtime is ticking. Splice, they get the capture, their second of this game, and lead 3-2 to two in 11 minutes. 2-2 two, two is always one of the more important score lines for specifically the same reason Kanga won game one. If you capture that point, which Splice has done, you can find a push right here. Ults are starting to come back online for them as well, so they have the resources. Do you think this is something that's feasible, or do you think there's going to be a good stall? Because, I mean, you're running into an open area against a Victor and a Strix. I think that's the real caveat that we're seeing here, is that no is the answer from me. Purely because the defensive line of sights, which Kanga Esports can hold with their Victor, their Strix, and we can't forget about Ruckus right here, just make it very, very difficult for Splice to push into Gore. And whilst Talos is better on offense than on defense, because you have the ability to flank, there's nowhere really to flank on this Frozen Guard base map. You've got to get right into the base and go for a full dive before you can even get to the high ground without any vertical mobility. So keep your eyes out for the ultimates. Keep your eyes out for true power and look for a big immortal dive to try and open up this push. All right, now a minute, 30 seconds left on the clock, and the payload has gotten to the point where it is nice out in the open. Kango do not have to worry about it. They can see pretty much everything, but well, the Illusory Rift, Rift is going to come through. Immortals almost charged up. They almost have a seismic crash, and they're going to start popping them left and right. Splice are going aggressive, but they're not getting anything out of this. They might find Joel's. They find him, but they trade out Ricotta and G-Bunny for it. And that was just miscoordination right there, Gore, and it was partially because of Fernando's position. The Illusory Rift comes up. That's the signal for everybody to go in. You've got this safety buffer. You've got a lot of healing coming through. Your effective health pool is higher just because of that. And you could see that Fernando wanted to dive on in, get into aggressive position, then use the Immortal and effectively act as this bridge to allow everybody from Splice to close the gap and get into the base. Kind of like saying like, I'm going to jam my foot in the door and hold it open for my friends. But the problem is Fernando got focused down, had to pop the Immortal too early, and as a result, not an effective strategy. Now with 36 seconds left, we still have the Scout, we still have the true power, you still have a seismic crash, but that's not enough to open up a base versus this Strix, unless you found a very lucky stun and maybe an incredible Cassie disengage off the map or something, Gore. I'm looking at Splice trying to charge ultimates right now, and that's about it. Find the shots wherever you can, find the healing wherever you can. Honestly, Vayne peeking out, taking that 1200, 2400 damage, falling back and giving that healing over to Ying is probably yeah. the best option they have right now. But being able to go into this round, lacking the Illusory Rift, we've seen how big that has been, but 53% is going to be enough. G-Bunny is going to end up going down. Two seconds left. They're not even looking for the overtime splice. Playing it smart, but they're going into the last point, three to three. We do have to factor, I think, Gore right there is Kanga, they look okay, right? They're going three to three. They know it comes down to the wire on this one. They know they have to be a bit more mindful of where these different picks are than last round. They did end up using two ultimates. They used a Dread Serpent, and they used as well the Barrage. But Victor's going to charge it up very quickly, and Dread Serpent will be available before the end of the game. Taking a look at the INAV instant replay, though, this was uh, Kanga Esports trying to find some damage with the Barrage, taking out Vayne. And despite all of that, the pincer just came on through. So many good ults that were used that round by Kanga, I think, specifically. We saw some ults come through from Splice, and again, it felt very staggered, very wow. out of the ordinary. And sitting about, what is that? Well, now 20,000. Was almost 30,000 earlier. Damage ahead is going to be Nino. Item economy still in favor of Splice. Kanga Esports, so they've got their offensive items online. Look at Reflexes and Compensator in this loadout as well. 80% reduced recoil. Minim is a laser right now, playing a bit of the Leon on Victor, it seems like. Good grenade. That'll reveal G-Bunny. They know that the Fernando is around there. They see the Ying. They know that Cassie's forced back. G-Bunny is being so patient, waiting for a flank. And all the while, 12% on the objective. But this Inara has not had a huge amount of effect so far. And Ninim knows that they've got to start running. And they've got to be careful of this Fernando. As here comes true power. And that's going to 
gonna lock down the Maldamba. Now Chronic's not being available is gonna make a big difference, but Corlin does find Ricotta. G Bunny's incredibly low. All they need is a couple more shots, but they're losing Joel's in the process. This is going to be some big losses for Kanga in terms of their control, and they're gonna end up having to fall back a little bit. The aggression's still gonna be applied, but Ninim's incredibly low. Rhino is left on his own, and they're both going to be taken down. Staggered out behind the team as well. That's 66% for Splice. They're looking to push to a game three. And a really big thing, Gore, right there. The target polarization came through and it was onto the Maldam, but that was the play that was able to turn things around with Dread Serpent last time. And now that's only at 92% and a beautiful impasse right there at the end from Vayne is all you need just as Ash is about to get one of our little booties onto the objective. <laughs> or big armored booties, I think we should say. And it's just not enough. What a play from Splice. Great objective control. And that whole thing about we've got to get this flank going didn't come from Talos this time. Actually came from Fernando, but the true power right there to re-engage at the end. You can never underestimate that on a map like Frozen God. So after they actually got that grenade reveal early on Fernando, and I, I want your thoughts on this, was it right for G Bunny? He just stayed there. He yeah. just waited it out and then ended up coming through. It works out well for Splice. Should Kanga have done something different? So I don't think so because you reveal G Bunny right, and either Kanga fully collapsed back on the Fernando to run, in which case they get collapsed on in tandem or they just kind of have to ignore it, which is what they did, try and find another pick in the meantime, and they weren't able to. Great positioning again from this team of Splice. Well, it's either the big plays or the small plays that are going to make the big difference for this as we go to game number three. Let's throw it back to the desk and prepare for that. Well, well, well. Interesting here. Uh, the wall uh, shuts it all down. Kanga can't even touch again. Splice in an electric victory, take game two, and now have a chance to move on in this tournament in game three. However, Kanga still battling out. They looked a little dejected, though. I mean, admittedly, you did lose a, a game yeah. that you could have won. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not making it easy for themselves with these drafts, oh, I no. feel like. Their ults weren't great down the stretch there. We saw another Hexfire go entirely into a wall. We saw that the Ash ult was the most questionable thing at the absolutely, start. Absolutely, absolutely. She's just alone for the full, like, eight-second duration. And I'm just like, what's the what's the plan here? What are you, what are you trying to accomplish? You, yeah. yeah, they were just so worried. They were so worried about that Talus dive. They're just like, they're sitting in the corner like this, just kind of looking around waiting for it and uh you know it came through perfectly and it actually came through on a chronic this round oh yeah i mean that last mid was so good by splice and so i, I kanga i think played really bad splice had so much patience like you you think na you think oh they're gonna walk and yeah they're gonna, they're gonna play hyper aggressive they, they 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 don't have the coordination but but splice they they had patience g bunny just waited he just like, sat on mount taunted behind that wall three peaked as soon as they're ready to go in collapsed at the same time and Kanga didn't immediately recognize that mid yeah. was over. Yeah. They, they stood there, they watched them cap the point. We're like, man, if only there was something I could do other yeah. than wait to die. Yeah, exactly. Okay. It was it was a wonderful kind of display of a few little things. One, I think team fight direction was nice for Splice. They had a good opportunity to make that Fernando Immortal plus the Talus Rune of Travel into the true power work out, but it was just kind of the coordination was sloppy on that one. But then G-Bunny's patience at the very end. I want to talk about that last point fight because you, you were right. They did all get corralled, so to speak, like sheep. And it was G-Bunny just kind of waiting on his mount. It was just kind of standing there, and eventually something happened. Chronix gets poked, and then it's like, oh, God, what what do we do from here? Yeah. Stacking up and getting corralled on that wall, it's just like it, it, it was bad the first round. And so I'm surprised that they, they let went it happen back again, it. man. Yeah, they basically set up a conga line for a triple fireball. And so that was the MVP Steel Series uh, MVP was Shadow, who played really, really well. 2.2 KDA. And, and a lot of moments for these guys came in spurts. Shadow had a good moment in the last round, was a little quiet on some of these pushes, but had some nice damage. Uh, Ricotta as well had a really nice couple of early rounds, but then later in the mid game didn't have as much flair to, to go off of. But overall, Shadow, what do you think? The, the Cassie first pick ended up working? Yeah, it absolutely did. I mean, they clearly had a plan going into this map. And, and with their composition, their, Shadow has to do a lot. You know, because Ricotta, he's not doing a lot of damage. He's right. not supposed to right. in their composition. He's there just for the executes, the cauterize. Um, but Shadow has to do that damage. He has yeah. to get those confirms, and, and he absolutely did. A big thing they said about Shadow, too, is that he's young. He's a really young guy, and that everyone else, you see G-Bunny, and he gets up out of his chair. He's clapping. Everyone else feels a little bit more confident. Yeah. They've experienced life. And they <laughs> say, Shadow's, Shadow's young. He, You know, we feel confident about everyone, but we're trying to get him up to speed. I feel like he's made a good transition here. That's a good way to get in your opponent's fit, like the get up, you know, walking back and forth, pointing across. I don't like this little like the clap, the clap, clap the as clap. I look over my monitor. All you see is like my eyes and my nose. That's just yeah. so weak. To I, me. I, I didn't like it either. I'll say on the receiving end it's, of it, yeah. <laughs> I can confirm that. Well, you know what? I like to talk. You got to talk trash after the results. But here's the thing: mid 
mid-set talking trash is always rough because it comes back to haunt you either way. Because if you lose, <laughs> you know, either side loses and they both talk trash. Somebody's not feeling good after that L. But Chronix and Aspect there matching up. It's uh, been, a, been a battle of supports. This time it goes the way of Splice. I will say this from a, from a viewer. It looks like Splice have gotten the better end of the draft two games in a row. And Kanga yeah. have had to outplay the draft that I think naturally falls towards Splice. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree. I think Spice has been drafting really well. I I'm not sure if this is still the case, but uh, Ricotta was their drafter uh, after for a while, and he's been he's been doing really well in Kanga. I mean, the experience, the, the time they've played against each other, I think absolutely shows. And Spice has practiced. They, they were scrimming last night. Yeah. This is a team that's that's been really working for this moment, right? We all know that online was a terrific disappointment for them, and it was absolutely not what they wanted to say. This is Splice. This is what we're about. This is what we're looking to to go forward. This is not the roster that we want to say failed. So they said LAN, and this was two months ago when I talked to, to Vayne, actually. He said, this is where we want to show the world who we are. Mm -hmm. And so far, I mean, I thought Kango would have had a much easier time with Splice, and that's not proving to be the case. Certainly. And uh, again, I want to bring it back to these drafts. I hope that they Try something a little bit different. It feels like they're getting a bit predictable. I feel like Splice are going into this mm. game three like they're planning on pitching, picking Ash and Ruckus again, almost no matter what we do. Yeah. I, I, th so what's the change then? What's the change? Let's, let's the talk change about The change for Kanga? Yeah, yeah. What do you do? Because I feel like they have lost the draft two times in a row. I think that giving up Slightly. the Inara, letting the Inara just sit on point multiple times in a row, uh, it, it's not it's not the play. I mean, it, it's, it's EU. They do that because it works, you know, and, and they're just letting Splice do it. They thought that the Willow would be enough, and Willow is good into Inara, but it's not a hard counter into Inara, because Inara mm. just DRs and walks out. And unless you have an insane amount of damage on your team and everybody's shooting her, she's going to get out of the dead zone, she's going to wall herself off, she's going to get rehealed because they're getting Ying every time, too. That was a big thing, too. The Ying without the Leon. The mm. Leon banned out, and that's such a big counter to her because of the AoE cleave of the 90% anti-heal. So is it, is it in the ban phase that's setting this up for Splice? That's a really good ban against Kanga in particular because that's something both Corlin and Ninim can flex onto. If they need something weird from Ninim, yeah. uh, that's something that Corlin is not going to be afraid to play in the hit scan. Like you mentioned, that, that talent Death and Taxes, man, it's just so effective. And you know what, Ricotta, too. I mean, he could play the Leon, but he could also play the Talus really very well, very effectively. You mentioned the damage was a little low, but not to have uh, viewers judge him by oh, that Oh, yeah, damage. no. I, always, I even said, like, I really hope Twitch chat isn't digging into Ricotta being low on the damage charts. Because, I mean, one of you, load into load into Frozen Guard in a casual right now. Play Talus. Tell me how you do. <laughs> Tell it, me how you do. Yeah. It's not going to be great. Yeah, it's but not it, easy. They execute with it. That's the whole point of it. They have that cauterize. They can they can just get Spurts, finishes. right? Yeah. Moments. And guaranteed you... retakes. Right. The Talus can wait forever and then instantly be on them with the true power like they tried to do. They got value out of it. The synergy. I mean, you, you have Yang who could do the same thing, too, with with Illusory Rift and teleport to the... It's kind of crazy how three members on that team could can just show up at one point in time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is, I think, talking to the strength of what Splice have brought. It's surprising me. It's continuing to surprise viewers. And I think Kanga now are a little surprised. They barely escaped Game 1, didn't escape Game 2. It's all down to Game 3 here, fellas on Stone Keep. What's the big differentiator now as we head into this map, the final map to set it off? Kanga's pick. You know, what is what are we going to see here? Blasters? Is, blasters. It, is it more the conversation? I think getting Corlin back on a blaster because Ninim's not... I don't think either of those players are the most flexible players, right? So they, they need to kind of go with what they know here. They need to keep uh, Ninim's pick open here and I think that means giving... I don't know if Drogos will make it through, but it means getting Corlin onto a blaster for me. It's going to be how deep they dig into their hero pools, too. Because mm. they, they obviously want to pull something out that maybe Spice isn't expecting, because right. they're, they're clearly very prepared for this. What do you think happens? Because, you know, if you have the blasters, you know, you're taking them in, in different pick slots, and maybe you're, or you're banning them, right? Because then you can't ban the, the Leon, and then if you're ban banning blasters, you can't ban as many tanks, which gives... Who are the advantage here? If you open up better tanks, who do you think wins? Is it Kanga, or is it Splice? <sighs> I would honestly give it to Splice with how well their tanks ha have with been Vane playing. With Vayne and G Bunny's performance Vane and G have been doing, except I mean, through almost all their. I mean, maybe not VP, but that was kind of just a one-sided affair anyway. Sure. Uh, I think they've been performing exceptionally. So if the have, focus is have. on letting tanks through, I I, I would give the advantage to Splice. You feel the same way? Uh, I feel like Kengar are just going to run uh, Ash and Ruckus again, or at, at, at least Ruckus. I'm I'm pretty sure, man. I, I the way that it's coming through very very early Ash picks, uh, but that is you know as a result obviously of of the heavy heavy frontline bans that have been happening in this set so far. Yeah, I don't even know. They already had first picked Cassie, so actually ta having taken the Ash into it, Ash is one of the highest health front lines. That's so she, true. She suffers the most from at base. The game. Absolutely. Yeah, even, and most people are running heavy running metal some pretty, cards, yeah. pretty high. Yeah. You know, 750 extra health. Yeah, so Stonekeep, we're about to load in here for game number three. 
Picks and bands are on your way. A little shot of Os Rhino rubbing his eyes. I'm just worried about them not being fired up enough, right? Because Splice, mm -hmm. it does know, feel like the energy went down. Are certainly, certainly feeling themselves. But you know, maybe this this sort of like long lull in between games can help equalize that a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it definitely benefits a team who wasn't feeling the momentum to have a longer break. Mm -hmm. And some teams do play better. Uh, not not a ton, but some teams do play better in that like laser focus, mm. just cold, dead, emo uh, emotionless. Like <laughs> this is the plan. This is the plan. This is the you plan. Know. Execute. We, yeah, exactly. Uh, whether Kanga is one of those teams or not uh, stands to be seen. Uh, Spice clearly is not. Yes. From how fired up they're trying to get G Bunny doing I the think, double fist. Yeah, that's like the biggest thing for me right now because it's like I knew what Splice's plan was in Frozen Guard. I didn't know I, what was I, what was the win condition for Kanga not losing to the yeah, Talus not dive. losing to their to their plan. Yeah. Please don't kill Twitch. Yeah, please. I guess. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's that, was, that was basically yeah. it. It was like they didn't have a composition to protect him other than maybe putting up a Fortress Breaker in the way, and then hoping he gets a kill before it runs out. Draft phase got weird, man. I mean, who first picks Cassie? That's that's not happening. It did in this get meta. weird. That's not yeah. happening, and I think Kanga were thrown for a loop. Like, wait, what, are they baiting us? Like, what, do we? And then at the end of the day, too, because of their way they prioritize their damage picks, I don't think the flexibility onto who ended up actually playing. Um, I forget. Who ended up playing what? Uh, the Victor? Or? The lat? No, we know Ninim was on the Victor. I was just Corlin saying. Corlin was on the Strix. Yes, Corlin on the yeah. Strix. It almost forced, I think, because the Leon was banned. Willow wasn't great on that map. No. Corlin was like, well, Strix, right? I mean, that was the only thing they could see. Maybe that's, that's the That's why we were both like, I don't know what he's going to play. Exactly. <laughs> and I felt like that was a really good phase because they were like, you know, Ricotta, he could play the Strix. That's, his, that's, a, that's a positive. Yeah. Plays the Talos, that's a positive. I mean, I, you know, he's good at it. It's not that it's the best champion ever, but he can make it work. And we saw that there. More frontline bans, guys. Targeted bans. This yeah. is targeted. More bans. Kanga's were, getting Khan or Makoa here. Yeah, they were letting the, the power tanks. They getting were letting. Uh, they getting were letting. Khan. Yeah, they were letting Inara just sit on point. They're like, all right, well, let's uh, stop letting them do that. Yep. They ban Nando because G Bunny's been performing really well on it. The Immortal is such value, especially in the keep fight. Actually, <gasps> I like that. This is okay at. here because I think uh, uh, Kanga could potentially look to put Ninim on Andro here, and then that would open up Leon for Corlin for if it survives that long. I mean, that's a tall ask. We've got big, big drafts here, and the thing is, oh wow, and I kind of like this. Victor is absurd on Stone Keep. Yeah, He's why? So good. The, the, you, Tell the he, viewers. You, you try to hide around a corner. Up top, you just get shrapneled. Like if you're playing a tank on Stone Keep, Champions let's say you're on defense, right? You're holding the upper, the upper lane. The you yeah. get low, you oh, maybe oh I'll jump to the side, I'll stand on the railing, and hope I don't, and I can dodge everything. Yeah. Except you know, 1,900 damage from two victory <laughs> grenades coming around the corner. Exactly. Uh, Here is the big question though. Guys, the Ying available now because they've let through the Khan, the Makoa, and now not a Blat, not the Drogo's taken. It seems like the battle of maybe anti-heal and pressure has been kind of going towards the, I'm going to wait if you take it. I'm going to wait to see if Neil. you take it. And they will take it now, the Leon and the Ying. Do you feel comfortable taking Drogo's into this? If On Stone help, Keep, don't hesitate to I ask. think so. Because you can play inside keep inside the keep fight, which is the high ground above the point. Right. Um, you can you can just hide behind the stairs, you know, jump into a spit. Uh, right now, it doesn't look like Splice want to take. I don't think fighting. they want it. Clearly, no, not with not with Khan into Makoa. I think Khan on this map kind of suffers oh. under the pressure you can get. He, it's really hard for him to get a really solid ult. Yeah. Unless you're playing from the low ground. Yeah. And if you're playing from the low ground, I mean, that's not a real advantage in, on in any game. This is interesting here. They're not they're not going for the Drogo bait. Yeah. I feel all. like it's just shadows and too much of a rhythm right now. Nice. Why not? There's She's value so in three in a row. Big, Absolutely. Big game into Makoa as well. I mean Agent Rage, sure. 16, 70, 16. The Leviathan yeah, the Leviathan health. It's you're nutty. Doing, yeah. A ton of damage every shot. That, that's how you're gonna deal with the Makoa pressure in general. So this is their draft, guys. I mean, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna grab a Maldamba at the end, and you're gonna see the ruckus here from Kanga. And Kanga taking Ruckus is smart, I think, because they're they're right now looking at Splice's draft. I think they want to win keep. They want to own that high ground. Um, Makoa Leviathan is going to be hard to deal Ooh. with. Up there. Ooh, this is good dive. I mean, this is this is really good aggro enemy. from Kanga here. I, I like being able to pop the illusory rip. Yes, man, they're going to get in your grill with Woo. the Ruckus with the Andro here. Ricotta is in, and has play really, really safe. He's going to have to play like he did on split. The second he, he gets to 60% HP, he's turning tail and he's running. Interesting, interesting ban and draft priority here. The last pick, unlike what Kanga did, and it didn't work out for them. They drafted their damage last, picked up their support early, and then kind of were forced into the Strix. Everyone knew the Maldamba was coming or a support was coming here. 
So the Cassie, the Victor, the Ash, the Khan. How do you feel about that going up against the Makoa, the Leon, the damage at the end? I mean, I'm shook. Uh, I'm nervous for Kanga, man. Uh, I was yeah. not. I did not expect this from Splice coming into the day. I like Kanga's draft. I do. I think a lot of pressure is going to come down to Aspect mm. because they're all about like their comp is all dive, right? Yeah. Damba is a ton of peel. If Aspect isn't peeling perfectly. They're just gonna they're just gonna get wiped out. A lot yeah, of win so. conditions, no need to guess here. Let's let the players tell us who's going on and who's dropping out of the tournament. Send it to uh, Gormizer and Vox to cast the game. That is it. This is gonna be game number three, the last game for one of these teams to play on land. And Vox, you were caught maybe a little off guard by the Androxus pick. Flank's not necessarily in Kanga's wheelhouse for most of the land. No, looking through our past drafts, this is the is the second time it, they've run a flank so far this land. They ran it versus Team Cryptic when they ran, you know, uh, Torvald Talus combo, which is a very strong combo that we've expected. Now they're running the highest win rate flanker overall in this land so far with Ninum, the cosplay comrade, on the heads will roll and Droxus. Check out the rest of these uh, little bits of info coming through on the scoreboard. Everything standard in terms of talent score. That's kind of what we expect right here. But heading around, this is a big flank. This is the dive that we were talking about. Ricardo hasn't seen it coming. Oh no. Notably, big game has been picked up for Cassie, but Ninim looking to try and do his best Edrum cosplay as he comes through, looking for Missed a the punch very reset. That's solid, huge. solid and again. cosplay, but nothing incredible. Honestly, like, I mean, this has been more lackluster than anything. The punches have not been finding their home. He hasn't been finding that many shots, and, and again, a lot of times he's just fallen out of the air flat. Yeah, Ninim is actually, Ninim is trying to, every single time they dive in near a player, get a punch reset on that dash, right? Reduce the 10 seconds thanks to the... Uh, the loadout card which Ninim is running. And whilst Ninim does manage to pick up first blood, that was three times in a row when they were a little bit short on the range. So you can tell that this is Ninim maybe not having the most experience with this. And there we go, Abyssal Touch 5 coming through and through the warp 5. Ninim is trying to close the gap on people very quickly. But look at this stagger on aspect right now. My goodness, that is beautiful. And Kanker Esports, they get the first objective point there very easily. Being able to find the kill right there with the punch, Ninim is coming through. And Androxus, I will say, especially after a land of not playing him, it's going to require a little bit of warm up. We've said in I'd the agree. past that pretty much any player, especially at this level, is going to have an Androxus in their pocket. I think every right. single player has. It used to be the way to carry yourself through ranked. As of now, it's just getting warmed up, figuring him out, remembering exactly the distance of the punch, where the shots need to go, your pacing. And I expect that, I mean, with the way it went early on, Ninim is going to slowly but surely escalate from maybe making a couple mistakes to being flawless towards the end of the game. Yeah, and that's a really big one as well, folks. You've got to remember that this punch doesn't have a visual indicator of how far it is. You've got to train your brain to know that size. But let's talk about how the fact that Kanga Esports, they had a capture in under two minutes score. Now they've broken the base. The payload is 80%, 90% of the way through. It's one minute and 30 seconds on the clock. And now Illusory Rift comes out and Kanga are looking for conversion. I mean, Illusory Rift has been popped. They're going as hard as they can. Hexafire is going through. Chronix finds G-Bunny and nobody else from Splice jumps down. I'm sorry. I... They're all either locked away or just pushed off. Uh, is Spl Splice playing this game, Gore? They seem to be a bit of a non-factor right now. Maybe that bathroom break definitely. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's where all the talent was. Was the pressure coming through? That's why Either you way, you can't let Ricardo go to the bathroom, folks. It's just it's just that reset, right? You take it, you take a hand off the keyboard and mouse for a second, and it's just you got to get back into the flow of things. But <laughs> I'd say the Kanga they're gonna be feeling feeling pretty cool after that one. All the picks which Splice drafted this big game cast to deal with the Makoa, you know, and the Ruckus as well. The Victor for just the consistent damage output didn't really do anything. And we knew that this was going to be a dive come from Kanga, with zero deaths across the board for them so far. Splice, zero kills on the board. We knew that they were going to go for a dive. We knew that they were going to pull off a big flank. The desk was talking about it. The draft is telegraphing it. And yet, Splice just didn't know how to deal with it. They don't have any counter flank pressure. They've got to rely on their Ash to do something a little bit better this time. But Ninim is sitting there. Recursed Arm is ready. Shadow very low. That retreat, though, Gore doesn't find the kill. Just going to be looking back. Big game has been picked up for Shadow again, so it's not going to be doing maybe as much against Androx as it could be. But a lot of the pressure coming out now because of the cast, because of the victory, and because of the comeback mechanic might be enough right here. A cursed arm popped up in the air looking for a kill, looking to try and find it. And it's going to be Aspect Beautiful. that is off the board, but it's after losing two teammates and not able to find the kill onto Ricotta. Kanga honestly just need to go for the reset, but I mean, comeback mechanic is going to be putting a lot of pressure on him. And these frag grenades from Mercada, I mean, you're not getting to that point without, unless you're Makoa maybe, being pretty low on the objective. There's the big overpower coming through from Khan. Joel's gets focused. Makoa's shell shield keeps them safe. Oh my god, Joel's gets G Bunny, turns it around. Double kill for Joel's shadow, takes them out, but it's all about Kanga on the retake here, Gore. 
58% picked up. Splice Aspect, the only one left alive. And there's only so much a lonely Maldamba can do. He's going to have to hide back and wait. But that's going to be a beautiful hook, pulling Cheap Bunny right out of it. It's not going to be enough to find the kill just yet. But Ninim is getting aggressive, trying to dance around him, try and find that kill. But as it is right now, they're just corralling Splice in the corner, making sure they stay out of there. Ancient Rage even popped just to keep control of this objective at 96% and rising. Oh my god, look at that as well. Enlightenment used there to immune the damage from Shoulder Bash. Just keep this Ash off the objective, but they still find a way on in. Oh. There's the contest coming through. Ricarda takes down Ninim. G Bunny is holding down the objective. Joel's Nos right away here. Big Hexafire comes through. Gore, can it secure this point? Trying to do whatever they can. Ricarda doing every bit of damage. Barrage is available, and he's going to go for the drop, but he doesn't know who to target. Rhino going to come down, but everyone steps off. Splice just seed the point over to Kanga. They don't even pick up the kill onto the Makoa. It's insult to injury as Joel's finds two, and now Kanga find themselves up three to nothing in the potentially last round of the set. And you could see that Shadow and Cassie dodge rolled in, but it was just there a fraction of a second, millisecond score too late. And Joel's the double kill disaster demolition machine right now on this Ruckus, putting up so much frontline pressure. Ninim takes the high ground. There's the punch reset. That's a seed shield though, but Nenim can get up and out and round and maybe look to get back onto these stairs again if they want to, just keeping themselves in the air, waiting for a heal and the opportunity to go on in. There's another punch reset. Headshots come on through. A Ooh. lot of damage onto the Ash. And can anybody try and hold this high ground versus this Androxa score? Nenim right now has a little bit of memory of that stun into just Victor plowing into him with damage, and that's going to be a big accursed arm, at least forcing Good people to remember Splice back into the base. As it is, a minute and 30 seconds left, but they're doing what they did last round. They're just walking it in as far as they're concerned. G-Bunny going to drop down. Vayne going to drop down, but Vayne is dead. G-Bunny is just forced into the corner with a shield and that does not have ripped. the health bar to stand here. That is going to be Kanga walking it forward. Aspect doing whatever he can. The bodies are dropping. They're falling, but it's never going to be enough. Kanga come through 4-0 on the last map and move themselves forward in the bracket. My goodness, Gore, I said that when we came into this day-to-day, -day, based off of everything we've seen through the tournament so far, flanks are going to be the determining factor in who wins and who potentially goes home. And this was an elimination match. Kanga Esports, they keep themselves in the bracket. They send Splice home, the North American PPL team. And you can see that the, everybody's kind of just going, OK, we took them to three. It's a good set. Last game was a sweep, and there were some definitely, definitely some mistakes from Splice there, but Kanga Esports playing absolutely lights out. Well, 4-2, 4-3, and 4-0 Kanga feeling happy as they go forward. Let's go back to the desk to close out this set. Wow. Well, fantastic job from both teams. What a set. Kanga Esports move on. They will take the next spot in the loser's bracket run as they will now face, I believe, Armada to see who goes to Worlds. What an incredible game, guys. And you know what? I got to say, this is a splice roster that, despite having some failures early on in the season, have shown improvement each and every step yeah. of the way. And at land, got more wins than we thought. And at this point, you know, I was like, blow up the team maybe. And I'm now I'm like, uh, I think you keep these guys <laughs> yeah. together. Maybe maybe a piece, you know, you see what happens, but I think you keep these guys together because they're showing they can play better and better. I mean, I think a big part of it is if they want it, if they want to keep doing it, right? If they want to keep improving at this point, you're right though, man. They have absolutely overperformed. Everyone I think should have hats off to Splice at this point. They made it a hell of a lot further than I anticipated they would and they should certainly be proud. And I think they were, right? They're yeah. smiling, they're hugging mm -hmm. each other like, man, what a run. Like, I don't think, and. Let me know what you think. I don't think this was Kanga just looking not that great today. I no, think Kanga's actually not. still looking good. I think this was Splice actually playing way better than we all expected. Oh yeah, Splice. I mean, this is Splice was Splice was expecting to qualify. I mean, they're they're really confident in, yeah. in themselves. You know. Um, I mean, you think about it, they probably could have. I mean, they'd have a matchup against Armada, but that's not inconceivable. That oh they yeah, absolutely. Done that. And that last map, I think honestly came a lot down to draft. Yeah. I, I think. I mean, it did. Khan is a good tank, but as as a power tank, uh, <laughs> he. he his one of his big weaknesses is stone keep. Yes. Uh, there's so much elevation difference and like yes. not as many places to hide if you're not controlling keep that his alt doesn't get as much value and his shield doesn't get as much value. Yeah. You know? If you're shielding on the low ground and they're above you, you're basically doing nothing. I just thought their lineup was too strong. It was just they had the Leon the Ying, they had the the Makoa. I mean, I think you ban Makoa and you give him Khan and you let Khan try to be there. You know, you gotta Khan's your win condition. That's fine, but yeah. you still leave a lot on the table for yourself. Overall, though, I mean, you can say that about every single game. All the drafts made a big deal. And, of course, our MVP goes to Mr. Ninnum on the Andro. Cool. Headshots were rolling, as we've seen so often. Steel Series 
give it up for your man with the accursed arm. He made a huge impact Five in this game. KD, dude. Jeez. That's an insane number. The first mid, he actually played so well because Splice, Woo! Splice's plan, you know, well, oh, well, hold in the keep, we'll hold Mutu? the high ground. Hold he was the... everywhere, dude. Yeah. <laughs> he just, he just, he peeked every door, but he never, he never died doing that. He never that. committed. He yeah. constantly took so much damage and just always got out. And look at this insane play. Like, how did he hit those shots right there? <laughs> The punch was the hardest. Just the forgot. punch was insane. It's God given. God given. God, God given talent. Can't take it away from him. Can't take it away. Quick shout to the supports in this matchup. I think wow. Chronix and, uh, and Aspect. Aspect played phenomenally. Yep. Hit that nutty stun there. That was crazy. A couple more. Good good peel from Chronix in that Frozen Guard game. And and obviously, every team fight that looks so crazy, you know, everyone's just getting in there. It's fueled by an Illusory Rift. He had like three that game. Absolutely. I mean, I think at that point, you see that stun. Ninim goes down. You're like, oh, that. Could, I thought it was over. That turned it. And then it, the only thing that saves it is Chronix. Illusory Rift. Joel gets right out right dude. after this ruckus with like three HP. Right Right bro. afterwards when the barrage is coming uh, down and you're like, oh my goodness. The Koa shield appeal for it. Yeah. Nice. That's it, gutting for Splice it, fans absolutely. because I was so excited. I was like, yeah, my boy. Yeah. He's scooting. Don't, need to look scootin'. at me. Don't need to look at me when you say Splice fans. So here's the uh, <laughs> upper bracket, it. guys. Armada no, and Kanga are moving on. And so, Kanga and Armada going to have a very tight matchup later on today. We are going to be transitioning over to the other side of the loser's bracket, though. The Virtus Pro versus SK set coming up. Yeah. That is going to be a barn burner, I think. I think we should pay attention to how Armada played today as well, because like if they don't end up playing well and they get smoked by Kanga, right, that could have easily been Splice. Yeah, smoking that's Armada what I'm saying. Qualifying that's, for Worlds, so I hope Armada show up. That would be a huge story to tell, and of course, we want to let the players tell their own story. We have an interview here with Kanga after their win, so let's go ahead and send it to the floor, see what they have to say. Well, congratulations, Kanga. You move forward. You don't get eliminated just yet. You do still have a couple of matches before you can confirm anything solid for you. But, I mean, especially after game number two going 4-3, you clean it up 4-0 in the last game. How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling static. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, one of the big things which had come up in a lot of talk about draft for Kanga after, you you know, you've gone back to the Frozen Guard, you played that, you lost twice in it so far, and then we look at what you're doing for Stone Keep. That was your sixth flank play, uh, pick total, including this LAN and your online phase of the Australian PGS, the OCE PGS, excuse me. And one of the big things we've been seeing this tournament so far is that flank picks seem to be really big determining factors in these games. Do you feel that that's going to become more of a contributing factor to team success or less of one as time goes by? Yeah, they definitely contribute, and the draft's constantly evolving during these lands. Um, we're trying to hold strats back, but then at the same, because we've got three games potentially this day if we keep winning, but then at the same time, when it comes down to the wire, then you've got to just pull out everything you got. So it's like, yeah, do we want to confuse the next opponent, or do we want to just focus on beating this one? It's, it's a really hard throw up seeing as we're doing this loser bracket run. Well, we got discussion I want to say from players of like Pantheon, Trident saying that they had kind of helped you out like the whole region coming behind you guys to make sure that land went swimmingly. How much would you say that they've kind of helped impact you throughout this land or was it just kind of initial studying and a lot of practice? Yeah the OCE community's helped us out a ton. There's been like Archimedes who helped us do our spreadsheets and the data on all the teams. Yeah. That's like a really good like baseline to start from and then you yeah, obviously once you get to land um, we get a lot of our practice. We actually had a boot camp for this one, and you'll see that our boot camps like directly correspond with our performance. So obviously the NA and EU teams have a lot to offer as well, and being able to practice against them gives us a massive advantage. But yeah, OCA, we did as much as we yeah, could while we're us, there. Yeah, and it helps us learn the drafting while we're in America as well, just to acclimatize ourselves to like the drafting and stuff like that, so it really helps. Preparation then has been the name of the game for this team, Kanga Esports. And guys, just before we wrap things up, one step closer to HRX in the Paladins World Championship. Any shout outs to those back at home? Yeah, we're kind of shouted around the last one. So it's the OCE, Archimedes, obviously all our family and friends. And yeah, it was really good. Thanks for the. Thank you. Awesome stuff, guys. Thank you and congratulations. We'll see you later in the bracket. Always, no thanks.